Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Adrian Monk from the World Economic Forum, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you our co-chairs for this year's 2017 annual meeting. Uh, Hella Torning-Schmidt, Chief Executive Officer of Save the Children International in the United Kingdom. Brian Moynihan, Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer from Bank of America in the United States. Meg Whitman, President and Chief Executive Officer of Hewlett Packard Enterprise from the United States. Franz van Houten, President and Chief Executive Officer of Royal Philips from the Netherlands. And finally, Shamin Obeid Chinoy, documentary filmmaker and award winning uh, movie maker from SOC Films Pakistan. So we'll have a chance to hear from all of our co chairs this morning uh, on the theme of their expectations for this year's annual meeting and what's top of their minds. And then we'll have a chance for some questions afterwards. Uh, we'll be asking you to tell us where you're from and who you are before you ask your question. And uh, we're convening under the theme of responsive and responsible leadership. And uh, that will be the topic that is today's uh, for all of our co-chairs. So, Hella, I'm going to ask you to begin. Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, first of all, I want to say that I am very pleased and very honoured to have been asked to be the co-chair of this, uh, this year's World Economic Forum. I've been coming to the forum for many years uh, and feel part of the community. But I do think that this year's uh, headline makes a lot of sense, particularly following uh, the year 2016. The headline is responsive and responsible uh, leadership. What does that mean? Well, to me, uh, it means two things. Responsive means that you have to listen. It means that you have to listen to the people that you don't necessarily agree with, and you have to try and understand what they're saying. And I think that's very appropriate uh, as we come out of 2016. Responsible means putting a, a, a longer term um, view uh, in, in everything you do. And I'm, what I'm hoping to uh, to be part of this year's World Economic Forum is basically to remind world leaders, whether they are in politics, as I have been myself, uh, or in uh, uh, corp corporate leadership, to remind them that uh, not to put the short-term financial and political uh, interest uh, first, but actually align everything they're doing uh, with the framework uh, or the blueprint, if you will, that we already have for how we're going to make the world a better place. That framework uh, or that blueprint is uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and I'm hoping that everyone will leave this meeting actually knowing uh, how they're going to put one foot in front of the other to align everything they're doing with the Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm very pleased that uh, it, this has been chosen as the agenda for this year's meeting. And I feel we can leave this mountain uh, with real progress on actually asking ourselves, what can I do as a leader? Uh, and what, what can we do to, together to improve the state of the world by engaging in the sustainable development goals. So that's why I'm here and very happy to be part of this. Hello, thank you very much. Brian, can I ask for your reflections on this year's meeting? Sure. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to Klaus and the WEF team for putting together a, another uh, full and great agenda and under a great theme with responsive and responsible leadership. Um, it's a theme that's right for our times, as Klaus has laid out in some of his discussion, and I look forward to working with my fellow co-chairs and really all the participants in the meeting during the week. It's interesting because a couple of years ago in our company, we changed our sort of our mission to responsible growth, and, and the ideas behind that are very similar to what uh, Klaus talked about. We, you have to grow, no excuses. You have to do it the right way, and you have to be sustainable in everything you do. And as I thought about my role this week, I thought about how everybody, you start at home and how you live at home and, and how that plays out in the broader communities. And, you know, at the end of the day, we have to grow. Countries have to grow. Economies have to grow to create a bigger and bigger opportunity for all the citizens of the world. Uh, our industry, financial services, has to play a role in making that happen, but we have to do it the right way. The growth that has to take place has to be focused on all participants in the economy. And, and this forum and this week will remind us of that, and my uh, co-chair just spoke to it. It has to include everybody. It has to deal with the inequalities, the fallout, the ups and downs of market-based forces. It has to deal with developed and developing countries, urban and rural, all the different aspects. So it has to focus on all participants and, and make sure they're all taken care of. It also has to avoid excessive risks, the risks that we saw in the crisis uh, uh, almost a decade ago now that build up. We have to avoid that risk. And it also has to be sustainable, whether it's sustainable in the environmental context, whether it's sustainable investing in a future context, whether it's sustainable with dealing with the changes in technology that uh, 
that we all see and the impacts from that and well it's, whether it's also sustainable in building the safety nets uh, in societies around the world to help and make sure uh, all citizens are taken into account and, and dealt with fairly as, as the world's growth takes hold. So as I look forward to the week, uh, it's a week to learn, a week to be curious, a week to learn from other people, but importantly a week to continue the themes of responsive and responsible growth. Thank you very much. Meg, may I ask you for your reflections ahead of this week's meeting? Sure. Well, thank you very much, Adrian, and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, as a technology executive, um, one of the things I see every day is that technology has changed everything about how we live, how we work, how we interact. And I think we are at the very beginning of the change that technology will, uh, will um, impact the world. And um, if you think about it, technology is now disrupting every single industry and every single job. And my view is the pace of change is only going to accelerate. Think about the current technology that we have and then add on to that robotics, more automation, artificial intelligence, smarter devices, the Internet of Things, autonomous driving vehicles. This can be a tremendous force for good. I think technology will help make permanent uh, climate change uh, advances, change agriculture so that there is more food, um, can help water, medicine, diagnostics. But there is um, also a change that we have to be very focused on, which is that jobs are going to change, jobs will be lost, jobs will evolve, and this revolution is going to be ageless, it's going to be classless, and I think it's going to affect everyone. And I think it's up to business and government and academia in a partnership to manage this transition perhaps more aggressively than we have over the last 10 to 20 years. We've got to manage it thoughtfully, we've got to manage it deliberately, and we have to manage it with responsive and responsible leadership. <clears throat> and as I think about this week, um, I want to focus on how we can be more transparent and communicate more effectively with all the constituents who we interact with. Um, I want to think about how we as a collective group can drive more economic growth. Because if we could do only one thing, the acceleration of economic growth will solve many of these job transition challenges that so many of our, our employees, customers, and partners have. And um, we also have to think about education. I think now K through 12 education, at least in the United States, is becoming more and more out of step with what is required. And then how do we create a culture of lifelong learners? And I think if I could focus on one thing this week and, and look for in the um, sessions that I attend, is how do we rebuild trust in business, in government, in institutions, because I think what has happened in this dislocation, which quite frankly is caused to some degree by technology, the lack of trust um, among our citizens in virtually every country I think is a very acute problem. So delighted to be here, lots to think about, and uh, an excellent week I think for reflection on how each of us as individual leaders can manage this in a more effective way than uh, has been in, done in the past several years. Thank you very much. Franz, can I ask uh, you what your expectations are of this coming week? Sure, my pleasure. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm happy and proud to be uh, co-chair here at the World Economic Forum in this year, uh, especially around the theme of responsive uh, and responsible leadership, something that is close to my heart and also, I believe, close to the nature of uh, uh, my company, Philips. Um, for those of you who don't know, Philips is the one of the world's leading health technology companies. Um, in fact, over the last month, I've been part of the, the team instigating the World Economics Forum Compact for Responsive and Responsible Leadership. And obviously, I have signed it, and also the chairman of Philips, as we believe that these signatures uh, reinforce a set of common values um, underlining that companies have a role to play uh, with a longer term vision uh, but also a role to make the world more sustainable and unsurprisingly we have built in the SDGs the sustainable development goals of as, as formulated by the United Nations in this compact um, uh, you know how to make people healthy uh, improve their well-being make them have food uh, address the climate issues and so on and so on. These are all very relevant topics that I think are also very much on the mind of people in the world and maybe causing some of the 
the, the unrest and mistrust that was just talked about. So if we all, um, let's say, put our companies to work uh, in a responsible and responsive way, uh, we will actually make a better society. And so far, uh, over 100 CEOs since, uh, since yesterday have signed already. Um, one of my goals here in Davos is to make sure that we all move away from short-termism and sub-optimization towards a more inclusive way of entrepreneurship. The world is changing. Um, there is a lot of fragility and complexity. There's also progress in other parts of the world. We should not only look at the West. We should also uh, recognize that in Asia, billions of people actually have improved their lifestyle over the last 10 years. Um, so that is also great progress. Um, but obviously, there are challenges to, to deal with. Now, at Philips, we have made the decision to focus our company on improving health and well-being. Um, we have a clear vision to make the world healthier and more sustainable. And actually, we have said we want to touch and improve people's lives, three billion of them by the year 2025. Uh, we, we need to understand and truly listen how, for example, precision medicine can get to better outcomes, how more productive healthcare can lead to more affordable healthcare. And for example, in countries like Africa, we can bring primary care in areas where there are not even doctors. Uh, so making healthcare inclusive and accessible and affordable. Technology will play a big role in it. And over the last few years at the World Economic Forum, we have put health and healthcare as an important theme uh, on the agenda. And I'm very pleased and proud that I, as one of the governors around healthcare, we bring together uh, NGOs, providers, insurance companies, tech technology companies, in order to discuss how we can actually make people healthier, prevent disease, prevent the spread of uh, communicable diseases, but also how to deal with chronic disease. And technology will play a big role there. So for us, the North Star is how to make the world healthier. Um, I think this week there will be a lot of dialogue on how to take the next steps there, uh, whether it's food related, whether it's uh, technology related, healthcare related, I'm sure that we can make progress there. But then of course it's all about action and decisive action needs to be taken. Uh, and I think for me this week will be good when there is clarity of insight and also clarity of the actions we will take henceforth. And of course all CEOs then hopefully sign this compact for responsive and responsible leadership. Thank you. France, thank you very much. Shamin, uh, thanks for joining us as co-chair and also representing the fantastic Young Global Leaders community of the World Economic Forum. Can you just give us an indication of what you'll be, uh, will be top of your mind this week? Well, um, it's a great honor uh, to be the first artist to be a co-chair, and I think it, it really shows that the World Economic Forum is looking at a responsive and responsible leadership because um, everyone is talking about how arts and culture is no longer intangible. It is very much quantifiable, and if we are talking in the context of the World Economic Forum, then we should look at how arts and culture um, is transforming economies around the world. Um, and it's not only transforming economies in the way that is providing jobs and and regeneration of uh, neighborhoods and suppressed areas, but also the fact that it is contributing to uh, the GDP of uh, various countries. I mean, if you look at the United States right now, 3.25% of their GDP comes from the arts and culture, which is far higher than agriculture and tourism. Um, and so uh, we need to start having a real conversation about what arts and culture really is. Um, not only does it create empathy, um, not only does it bring people together, but I think the most important thing for me this week is to talk to leaders and to get a conversation centered around how businesses and world leaders can invest in arts and culture, not simply because it's something that they must, must do, but it's also because it makes good business sense for them to do so. Um, in Canada, which I call my second home, um, there's a very famous study that's recently been done, which shows that um, it's been done by the Canadian Business Council, which shows that in communities where art and culture is invested, 
uh, the respondents, 86% of respondents said overwhelmingly that it felt that they had a healthier life, uh, a better life. I mean, these, these are the statistics that are speaking about the future. Um, in the UK, you find that the Arts Council um, says that for every pound invested directly in public arts gives a return of five pounds back in taxes. And so this week, my hope is that we all simply not look at arts and culture as something that is separate from the entire conversation that is taking place here, but that is very much something that all of us need to talk about if we are going to talk about a world that is more inclusive. Thanks to our co-chairs. And can I just get a sense in the room of uh, who would like to ask a question? Okay, uh, we have microphones for you. Can we start perhaps at this end and take a couple um, and can you just tell us who you are and where you're from as well? Hi, uh, I'm Claire Zillman. I'm with Fortune Magazine. Uh, my question is for Ms. Whitman. Um, you talked about government being a partner in this effort, especially for making technology a force for good. I'm wondering if you think that um, President Trump, soon to be President Trump, is, uh, fits your definition of a responsive and responsible leader. Okay, great. And uh, on the front row? A similar question, Angela Charlton from the Associated Press. Um, it's really a question for all of you, your comments, um, notably in the beginning about listening to our adversaries. Um, what message would you send to Theresa May, who's speaking today about taking her economy out of the larger world, and uh, for Mr. Trump, who's obviously taking office on Friday on the issues of government responsiveness? Okay, and just lastly there, because um, I think we can, oh. Maybe lady at the back as well. Thank you, Hannes Koch, correspondent for German newspapers from Berlin. Two questions to uh, Ms. Torning Schmidt. First, what do you want to achieve for your purpose uh, to improving situation of children? And second, can you collect some real offers or contributions by corporations concerning uh, reaching the SDGs? Okay, thanks for that. So, a chance perhaps for our, um, our panelists to reflect on responsive and responsible leadership and examples of that in the current environment. Um, also, um, to Hella there, just on some of your hopes on children. Would you like to take that first, perhaps? Sure, sure. Um, well, first to the question about what the, the British government should be doing now. I'm hoping that both the British government and the American government uh, will stand by uh, their legacy uh, in terms of uh, their development, a humanitarian uh, work. Uh, and I'm hoping that that will happen uh, from the, the, the British side and, of course, the American side as well. We're still expecting a lot from the US in this, uh, this area, uh, and I hope that the new administration will live up to uh, the history and legacy of, the, um, uh, of any uh, US administration and also particularly Republican administration that have been very active in both humanitarian and development field. So that's one thing. Uh, to the question of what am I, as um, the only civil society representative here, uh, hoping to, uh, to do uh, as a, as a co-chair, well, I'm here to work for children. And I'm here to remind everyone uh, that we have actually, uh, one and a half years ago, made some really serious pledges to the most deprived people of this world, uh, particularly children. We promised, for example, in the, the Sustainable Development Goals that we would um, end uh, extreme poverty by 2030. Well, frankly, it's not going so well. Uh, we have uh, 350 million uh, children right now living in extreme poverty. In uh, the 13 years that we have left to 2030, we will have uh, put that figure down uh, to about 167 million uh, children living in extreme poverty. Not poverty, but extreme poverty. Um, and I'm basically here to ask everyone to align around uh, these goals and ask themselves, what can I do? And, that <clears throat> and I do think that the social compact that we are asking um, uh, any leader to sign from this meeting is a very powerful tool 
Because once you have signed this, this tool, you're actually saying that we will not let short-term political or uh, economic goals stop us, us from actually from reaching the long-term goal of a fairer um, and, and better world that, uh, that is aligned with sustainable development goals. That's why I think the compact that the business leaders will be signing is very powerful, because it means that everyone has to go back and ask, what can we do in our uh, company? And if that, and I'm sure that can work for children, uh, and let's just remind ourselves that apart from the moral obligation we have to help children in extreme poverty or with their education needs or whatever, we also have, a, it's also the smart choice because the children of this world, if, they, if they're growing up in poverty or not, not in safe places or without education, what kind of world will they be part of um, and what kind of future will they uh, be part of for all of us? So that's why I'm here uh, and I'm actually very hopeful that we can get some, uh, some real uh, steps in the right direction. Maybe, Brian, some of your reflections on the challenges facing political leaders as we look at it this week. And in an hour's time, I think we're going to be hearing from another of them uh, on, uh, on his thoughts on, on the global economy. Sure. I, I think if you, uh, political leaders uh, around the world are reflecting um, the trends in society that are dealing with some of the issues that uh, Franz and Meg and others spoke about, which is you know, dislocations coming from ch massive changes in technology, massive changes in ability to deliver goods and services on a global basis, and the institutions that we have that have developed over time have to change to develop to meet that. And so, you know, I think the number one uh, job for a leader of any enterprise, whether it's a civil or, or political or a business, is to be responsive to the people they lead, the case of customers or employees, and I think that the governor, the uh, political leaders, whether it's the president-elect of the United States, whether it's the uh, prime minister that I referenced earlier uh, speaking on, on the terms of leaving uh, the EU, uh, th these are all people who have to respond to their populace and, and deliver it. But they have to respond to 100 percent of their populations and figure out what's best for them. So I, I look forward to having the, the, the thing that one of the tenets of the meeting this year is also collaborative groups and, well, there's a lot of discussion about what you can collaborate on in, in the world and what can actually get done. The principles that uh, my colleague just spoke about, signing a, uh, a compact, and Bank of America has signed a compact also, uh, of long-termism is, is a good thing, and we believe in it, and I think we'll help keep everybody focused, as Franz said, on that North Star, where you're trying to go over the long-term and the ins and outs of the day-to-day -day will be dealt with. Um, um, yes, well, let me answer your question. So obviously, um, the election in the United States did not turn out the way I had hoped it would. But the election has occurred, and we as Americans have got to give our new president the benefit of the doubt. And he will have now a chance to um, prove that, uh, that he can d demonstrate responsive and responsible leadership. So my um, call to all Americans and, and my employees in particular was we now have to give him the benefit of the doubt. As I reflect on what these leaders must do, I'm, I, I hear very much what Brian is saying, is I think what this election um, in the United States and what Brexit showed us is there is a group of people who feels that they have been left behind by globalization and the changes that technology has um, really uh, caused to occur over the last several decades. And now, business, government, we have to think about how we manage that workforce transition, how we make sure that the left behind parts of all of our countries um, really do get a chance. And this comes back to very deliberate and thoughtful workforce trans transformation and transition. And the challenges that we have in the United States is the new jobs may not be geographically in the same place that the old jobs were. And so what do we do about people who are living in places where AI is not going to be uh, an employer, uh, autonomous driving vehicles aren't necessarily going to be there? How can we help those folks move into the new economy and take advantage? And I think, as I said, it's about education and it's about workforce, very careful workforce management and transition. Franz, your thoughts on those, on those two points? Well, I think a lot has been said. Um, Look, I believe in dialogue. Um, we all need to dialogue between leaders and business, between uh, with, let's say, the people in the society. Uh, that leads to a more inclusive and uh, cohesive uh, approach. Uh, I would worry about um, disruptive uh, measures or new fo found nationalism, closing borders. I think that would all not be very helpful. Um, in any case, um, 
businesses like ourselves at Philips, I mean, if you say roughly we have one third revenue in, in the US, one third in Europe, one third in Asia, our employment is like that as well. Right? And we can talk about these kind of things. And I also see that with technology evolution, um, uh, 3D printing, you know, the supply chains of the world will change. Um, and maybe that will lead to some uh, further uh, adaptations. And I think um, it's important that we all have uh, the dialogue around it and then create new opportunities. Because just trying to go back to the past, um, that may feel good, but actually is not going to work. Mm -hmm. So together we have to co-create the future. Uh, and you do that by teaming up and by being inclusive. And for that, the compact for responsive and responsible leadership is anchored around the SDGs is just the thing. And, um, you know, two years ago at the WEF, people started talking about it. Uh, now it's really becoming a movement. So I, I really see good and positive change here. And Shamin, uh, collaboration is one of the things that you, you do as, a, as an artist and, and filmmaker and perhaps winner-take-all politics uh, might learn something from, from the world you come from. Um, I, I have a slightly different take. I, I, I think that um, perhaps because I come from a different part of the world, um, I think that the world is far more polarized now uh, than it has ever been. Um, I find that the language of hate often trumps the language of dialogue and inclusiveness. Um, and I think that this is the time to speak up and this is the time to speak out when you see something that you do not agree with and something that is not true to your core values. Um, I think that um, it is not the time to stay quiet. It is not the time to hope that things will change. It is the time to, to push so that things do change and the world that you believe in and the values that you believe in stay and are not uh, overridden by another language that, that you do not subscribe to. Okay, we're almost out of time on this meeting. I know our coaches all have engagements pressing. Can I just take very quickly probably a one-line answer? Lady at the back. Cecily Liu from China Daily. I just wanted um, to ask what are your expectations for President Xi Jinping's address today and what are your expectations for China's role on responsive and responsible leadership? Okay, very quickly, I'm going to rattle down because I think we're, we've got okay. one and a half minutes and I think even a, the briefest of answers will exhaust our, our five panelists. But uh, in a, an hour's time, we'll hear from uh, China's president uh, and we'll know exactly what he, uh, he has to tell us. But expectations of China and its role, uh, Hella, can I just start with you? I'm her, I've, I've worked a lot with uh, China when I was Prime Minister of Denmark, I had a very good relationship uh, with, uh, with China. Uh, and I'm expecting uh, the Chinese leadership to, uh, to uh, engage in the global community. Uh, and I think being here is a sign of, of that. Uh, and also us, uh, telling us a little bit about how they will contribute to, um, to the sustainable development goals and be engaged in that. Short. I'd, I'd, say, <laughs> I'd say the same thing. I'm looking forward to hearing from the president and how he uh, will uh, be a responsive and responsible uh, leader in, on the world stage. And so it'll be a very interesting morning, I think. I'm looking forward to President Xi's um, uh, talk on um, the global economy and uh, sustainability. China can play a real important role in further uh, driving the world and the stability of the world. Uh, I think uh, the President Xi coming to Davao is already a sign of China being prepared uh, to contribute to, uh, to prosperity in the world. Well, uh, you know, China, um, living in Asia, China is playing a, uh, a huge role, especially in my home country of Pakistan. And to see how it can contribute to the greater growth of, of uh, the, its neighboring countries is something that I'm looking forward to hearing him talk about. Great. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks to our co-chairs. Uh, and I hope you'll get a chance to uh, hear proceedings this morning and uh, make the most of this year's annual meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.